Hello everyone! This video is on the topic of using management and prevention when training your dog. Now a very easy to understand example of this is teaching your dog not to counter surf. Now it's wonderful if you spend 20 minutes in a few training sessions marking and reinforcing your dog for ignoring food on the counter, but if your dog hasn't yet learned to reliably leave that food alone and you leave the house to go somewhere and you leave food out all over the counter and your dog is tall enough to reach it, at some point your dog might be thinking, ooh, that smells good, puts his paws up on the counter and then is highly reinforced by large quantities of novelty food that he might not have ever had before and then that experience is so reinforcing, it's going to be more reinforcing to do that when you leave the house than to ignore the food. So what can happen is if you're not done training your dog to reliably leave food on the counter when you when you go and then your dog has these wonderful reinforcing moments when you're when you're gone counter surfing it's actually going to increase the likelihood that your dog is going to counter surf for life so what i suggest especially if you just get a new dog or new puppy that you highly manage and prevent all these behaviors you don't want until you put in the time to train your dog. So it is extremely exhausting as an owner in the beginning. If you're doing all this management, it can feel exhausting, but what you're doing is saving yourself all this stress and management in the future. For example, years worth of having to hide the food on the counter. Um, so when I got my Border Collies, uh, they're tall enough to reach the counter and I made sure right in the first few weeks to work on not uh, not going after food on the table with low tables because they couldn't even reach the kitchen counters so that when they got tall enough to reach the kitchen counters I could work on it but I have all these dogs that I can leave with food on the counters if I so wish um, and I don't actually eat meat, and I probably wouldn't leave meat out on the counter, so maybe it's not as enticing for the dogs as someone who, who's a meat eater uh, that, that leaves food on the counter, but it's extremely easy because I don't have to manage the kitchen every time I leave. So all that work that I put in right at the beginning is paying off all the way down the line. And that's why I think it's extremely important to use management and prevention until you're getting reliable behaviors. An example of using prevention that could solve the behavior problem completely is say if you got a new puppy and the puppy, as soon as they got to the water bowl, started digging in the water bowl or splashing the water out with their mouth. Instead of trying to train the puppy how to interact with the water bowl that it's just for drinking, you could get one of those no spill water bowls or one of those little buckets, those metal buckets that you can clip to the side of an X pen or a wall and then it's just high enough that the puppy can uh, dip their head in to drink from. And just by changing what the water bowl looks like and making it not as inviting to want to dig in or turn over or pick up and take away, then after a couple of weeks, you could reintroduce the water bowl that you want the dog to use, and sometimes the dog won't even think to dig in it anymore because they've associated the bowl in the corner, meaning all about just drinking water rather than playing with. Another example of using management and prevention when training is if you're working with a dog that can be fearful, reactive, or maybe overexcited about certain stimuli in the environment. Say, for example, the dog is fearful or reactive or overexcited about people and you work on it when you're out and about, your dog sees a person, you say, good, and feed them a treat before your dog reacts. But then you go to work and say goodbye and then you leave them and your dog runs to the window and can see people passing and is either having a fearful response or reacting at the window. This is going to make the dog more likely to continue reacting and more likely to regress to reacting to these stimuli. So um, it's for my training, I like to use something called errorless learning, which is trying to achieve where you're not having errors in your training where the animal's rehearsing the undesirable behavior. So instead of uh, if you had a dog that was worried about people and dogs, instead of going to a very busy unpredictable area where suddenly you can't escape somebody and then your dog reacts, 
that's not going to yield as wonderful training results as if you set up an environment that you controlled. Say, for example, you had a stranger, not a stranger, stranger to your dog, a friend of yours, be a decoy stranger that you can control and you can keep that person uh, where, they, where your dog is below threshold and you can change your dog's emotional response and behavior one step at a time in easy approximations than taking your dog into an environment that is so unpredictable that things will happen that just ruin your training. So if you notice, say for example, you're doing training and your dog's reacted three times during the training session, you can say to yourself, oh my goodness, this is too hard for my dog. But when you're out and about, you can't control everything like you can when you do a setup with a decoy dog or a decoy person that's listening to you and you can adjust things to be easier for the dog if necessary. If you had a dog that was progressing to being able to walk in an unpredictable environment while feeling comfortable, but you wanted to maintain that positive experience, that safe experience, and that the dog can trust you that nothing bad is going to happen or nothing is going to overexcite the dog, uh, you could walk near your car and have a covered crate inside your car so that while in the environment, maybe settling on a blanket, sniffing around, you're close enough to your car that if you saw a loose dog or suddenly a large quantity of children running over or something that's just too much for your dog, you can walk to the car, put them inside, block the view, and you could even turn on the music inside the car until the distraction is gone or just leave and go to a different park or return home and return to the park when there's less going on. Now, it can be extremely difficult to find locations uh, that aren't unpredictable. For me, a lot of times, uh, a great location for, for a dog that's worried about other dogs off leash is parking lots around malls where there are busy roads and there's still interesting smells. Perhaps the, the mall or the parking lot in front of a shopping store also has um, some grass or some trees or plants around for the dog to investigate. And with the large parking lot, if it's empty, it's really easy to maintain a certain distance from people or dogs. So for example, you could park at the end of the parking lot and your dog could see people getting out of cars in the distance and obviously you wouldn't park in amongst cars uh, if your dog was worried about people because someone might just come out between the cars, for example. I hope you found this video helpful for your training. If you'd like to support my work, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to my channel. You can also become a supporting member of channel Kiko Pup by clicking the join button. See you later, guys.